Coming up on Nebraska Stories, don't call this bullfighter a rodeo clown. 2,000 kids from 49 states compete in the Science Olympics. We go behind the scenes as Antiques Roadshow comes treasure hunting in Nebraska. An artist's wife comes into her own. And a mysterious photo leads a young woman on a journey to trace her roots. My job is just keep riders safe. I gotta keep moving or else I'm gonna get stuck, you know? I'm Rowdy Moon, I'm from Sargent, Nebraska. I'm 18. Don't call me clown, call me bullfighter. Everybody who goes to a rodeo thinks the bullfighters are clowns. We're not rodeo clowns. We're not to make the crowd get all wild or anything. We're just to do our jobs and keep fighting bulls and keep everyone safe. Take it to him now, bud. Really hustle. People think we, we're kind of crazy or whatever, but you know, as long as you're smooth on your feet, we're, we all stay pretty safe. You see the way our bullfighter moved in there to keep the bull away from the cowboy? That's what he's all about. Way to be your Roddy. Nice job. Whenever a bull rider gets bucked off or something, you know, laying there sometimes. You never know if they're concussed or, you know, they, it can be anything. But I, al I always have to go to the bull's head first and pick them up and take them away. That way the bull rider's always out of danger. You know, if someone gets hung up, I, I sure try my hardest to get them out of there. I kind of think, what about the next one? If I'm, if I'm getting hurt, how am I going to make it? How am I going to recover? <laughs> If I have to take a hook and I, I have to take a hook and that's what it's what the job is. Hello, 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 hello. No score. You see the way Rowdy moved in there to keep the bull's attention? That's what he's all about. The Science Olympiad is very much like the Sports Olympiad in that teams compete for honors and medals, gold, silver, bronze actually to six places. We also compete for a national title and it's all about building a team to compete in different specific events that are all related to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. It is large, uh, 2,000 participants almost from again 49 states. You know, to me, this is how science, technology, engineering, mathematics ought to be taught and be getting our kids engaged in. It's just helped me like love science more throughout the years, and like I just can't live without it now. It's been awesome. It's I been mean, really we've had a great awesome. time. I think it was pretty dramatic, so I'd call it a win. Three, two, one, zero. They're trying to make a rocket stay in the air as long as possible without any parachute. It's a great engineering problem. They could solve it fairly easy with a parachute, but no, they have to adjust fins, centers of mass, center of gravity. Uh, you know, that really drives them to start thinking about physics and the real world. It's your rocket. Keep hanging on. I'm going to rotate it up. It's your rocket. My rocket. Okay, any last adjustments? 
three, two, one, zero. I'll tell you what I love about this because I am a teacher. This motivates kids to get into pure and applied science and technology, and that's what I'm all about. I love it. Three, two, one, zero, 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 zero. This is Mission Possible. It's an event where students take a lot of junk and they make something out of it. And so this year they're, they're dropping a golf ball into the device, but the device has to lift golf balls and put them in a scoring container. But along the way it has to use five forms of energy. And the trick is you have to do it in a certain amount of time, which they did not know until they got here today. We have a whole bunch of these little things we call memes set up, and they're chains of mechanical to electrical to mechanical to electrical. Uh, changes where each motor flips the switch which causes the next motor to turn on. So it's very uh, efficient. Alright, battery dead. Problem. So this is a, we've been doing a lot of tests with this so the batteries are probably dead. We're going to change the batteries out. That's why we do test runs. Make sure that things like that don't happen. In three, two, one. Much better. I like this event so much because it takes students through problem solving. They go through the engineering process to solve problems. They really like it. It's hands-on. They can be creative. They, they really get engaged. You almost have to make the students stop. They love this. They want to do this event all the time. This is forensics. It's, that's what they're supposed to do, is determine who did it. And the neat thing about this is that it's all logic. They have to put all of the evidence together to determine who really did it. It's, it's a very devious crime. Somebody has stolen a m money and set something on fire. Uh-oh. We're trying to figure out what these substances are, and um, we just have like different chemicals to help us out acid, bases, etc. It's pretty cool. <laughs> then we have blood samples too. If they get it, it's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, if they decide to just go with the surface evidence, they're not going to get it right. They have to think about it very deeply. This is an air trajectory event where students are to design and construct a device that's capable of launching a ball to a distance of eight meters. And what they want to do is be able to shoot far and close with great deal of accuracy. So they're trying to get within millimeters of a target. Short target. Three, two. We had a, um, like in a bellow, bellow system. So when it pushes down, it comes back out and we had a hammer that fall on it. There's a lot of education in this. They learn how to graph, they learn how to predict. They have to learn about experimentation and calibration of a device. They try something, it may not work at first, so they have to try something else. It develops critical thinking skills, it develops engineering skills, and they learn how to do ballistic curves. Launching, we are up! Oh, nice shot! We had to use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out where the distances should be and yeah. the angle which it should be at. We had to use it for the bucket shot. We had to use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the distance between us and the bucket was. And it worked. Da, 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 da. Three, two. Oh, up. Oh. We have a partner and we build a bridge uh, together and then we do, we test it on the hoppers that are back there and then you put a block on top and a chain that goes down and a bucket and then you're testing how much weight it can hold. So once it breaks then you stop testing. Okay, let me check it first before you go. Uh, that looks good. And then to calculate your score it's an efficiency so you take how much it weighed in grams, so up a max of 15,000 grams divided by the mass of your bridge and then you get an efficiency. It's hopefully a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's been stressful but fun at the same time. A lot of long hours put into just building a small boss, boss structure just to have it break in a minute. 
but it's rewarding to have. Yeah, it's all worth it at the end. Yeah, it's all worth it. Great job. So everybody loves to be best at something. That's a, it's a natural human trait. There's always a component for all 46 of the events of problem solving, some hands-on component where students have to demonstrate their knowledge and skill. A lot of kids don't figure they, they're capable of doing this until they get engaged in a real activity and they find out, I can do this. And they end up going on to higher levels of aspiration. So this is incredibly motivational for just millions of students over 30 years. You can see the passion that develops. In first place, our national champion from the state of California, Troy High School. I value them, they're cherished items, and they remind me of a person I love very much. You look like you're awfully excited. <laughs> Entering just... its second decade on television, Antiques Roadshow is the most watched long-running series on the PBS network. This summer, Antiques Roadshow made Omaha a stop on its annual national tour. Of course, we're all gonna go get a steak. <laughs> a production of WGBH, the Boston PBS station, the roadshow schedule runs like clockwork. Arrive in town on Thursday, set up on Friday, and tape the show on Saturday. We produce two things, an event and a television show. But in order to be able to greet everybody and set up what's going on behind us, we need that kind of space. And that, for the most part, is a convention center. The roadshow will produce enough content to create three one-hour programs from a single day's taping. To get that accomplished, they need a large number of hands on the job. All right, everybody ready? One, two, three. Get under it. Love our boss. I had a boss, but they still <laughs> like me anyway. Can you believe it? Here, here, hold the camera. I don't touch dirty. <laughs> I don't do dirty. <laughs> we will travel with 55 crew members. Most of them are from Boston, from either from G GBH or freelancers that we work with. I just want to double check the placement of the uh, backlights in this area, the, the stand lights. Fortunately, most of the crew that we work with has been with the Roadshow since its inception, so it's really like a big family reunion every summer that we get to see people that we don't work with, typically throughout the year. About 80% of the crew have been with the show since it first went into production. Included among those numbers are many of the Roadshow appraisers. Excuse me for one second, I just want to go look something up. When did you buy it again? 1986. And how much did you pay for it? 500. I think truthfully at the time when we were selected, it was season two and there was, they were slammed. Had no idea what sort of success it was gonna be. And they were showing up at cities and there was people, there were lines wrapped around buildings. Chicken feet. <laughs> this is Schmo. It, w it belonged to my great Aunt. Her name is Mavis. She came all the way from Wisconsin. You got Look orange and banana, lemon, wintergreen. <laughs> What were you hoping to find out today? I'd like to know more if the, who the maker was. Was it a New York cabinet maker? Brian Witherell lives in California where he works in the antique business started by his father. His expertise is Western material. I know you were asking, is there a famous maker on it? Can we say it's Herder Brothers or Patian Stimas? It's definitely not Herder Brothers. Um, there's a chance it's Patian Stimas. We work with a pool of about 150 experts. They pay their own way. They pay their own expenses. We give them lunch and breakfast on Saturday, plus about nine and a half million viewers a week. 
it's a lot of fun. The, the crew, I mean, we couldn't do it without the crew and everything that they do. So it's just a lot of fun and it's a long day. We're it's tiring, but we love what we do. The whole crew is like a big family. So I think people would be surprised. It's not just work, we really enjoy doing it. And much like the crew, the summer tour may be the only chance appraisers have to see each other. It's the only time I'll see Matt is five times a year on the road. Probably. Maybe we'll run into each other at another event. The only time I'll see Peter. No, it's time I've We're on opposite ends of the world, so. Right, exactly. And opposite we ends talk of on the world. phone, we consult all year long, but the only time we see each other is here. Yeah. I think one of my colleagues refers to this as camp for appraisers. Right. Appraiser camp. Yeah. So we have a good time. The adage, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life, seems to resonate among the Roadshow family. This is my mother as Errol Flynn, and this is my mother as Maureen O'Hara. My goodness, I didn't realize how racy that shot was. <laughs> you're, you're, you're open, open in front, down to the navel. And if you look here, you can see the position that Errol Flynn is standing in here. And the other shot is the Maureen O'Hara position. Such is the life for the wife of renowned movie poster illustrator Reynold Brown. See the shot, and, and that, there's a number of different pictures. In the 50s and 60s, Reynold Brown created movie posters for some of the biggest films in Hollywood. And his wife, Mary Louise Tejeda Brown, was the model who posed for his paintings. You want to be remembered like that? I can't even see. <laughs> I can't. Oh! <laughs> well, he, Show us that. I did whatever he needed. Saved us buying, pay, paying a model and all that other stuff. Mary was an artist in her own right. She had a promising career as an illustrator as well. But as the family grew and her husband's career took off, Mary willingly put her own artistic pursuits aside. She became the artist's wife. The art career came to an end in 1946 when the children started arriving. And this is what happens to almost all women artists is they're faced with the fact that their professional career comes to an end when the first kid arrives. And if you got eight kids, then it's really at an end. As the couple approached retirement, they moved from the Los Angeles area to the hilly Pine Ridge landscape near Shadron. We drove out here several times, and so when we came, we could see how beautiful it was around here. And all. So uh, we kind of fell in love with it. The new surroundings inspired her to paint again. When I came here, then I just went out and just whatever I saw that interested me, I'd stop the car, get out, set up my easel and start painting. But now that I can't just so easily jump in the car and go, I have to think of things I can do while I'm in the room. In 1991, Reno Brown passed away. Even before his death, Mary began to lose her eyesight due to macular degeneration. Now, even her brightly colored pastels appear to her in shadow. On this eye, it's I see things on the edge of the eye. I don't see the center. So if I close here, the center, I still see, but I'm, it's fuzzy. Now this eye, I can see the center, but I can't see the edge. So thank God, <laughs> it sort of balances out. Since her view of the world is now seen through the slit of a crescent moon, her memories are the visuals that drive her now. The more I'm trying to do things, the less I'm seeing. I know it's there because my men mental health tells me it's there. So, and with my knowledge of color, I can put a stroke there and make it into a leaf because I know that. Not necessarily because it's I see it, but I see it in my mind. Mary's paintings have grown increasingly impressionistic with her deteriorating eyesight. 
but you can still recognize the distinctive landscape of this part of the northern panhandle. And she wants others to really see the beauty of the area. I was trying to make the people aware of what they had. They're surrounded with beauty, but they do not see it. It's just like now they drive in the car and they're busy on the cell phone or whatever else they've got. They've got this thing here and another thing here. They don't see a blooming thing. Mary Louise Tejeda Brown has created more than 1,200 paintings and sketches with her colorful pastels. But at the age of 92, she is slowing down. A shoulder injury now makes it difficult for her to paint or draw at all but she won't give up. All I can say is, I've done it since I was a little girl, and I'll keep probably doing it till I die. <laughs> But it doesn't mean it's going to be a great painting or anything. I don't care, really, at this point. I'm just as long as I can try, and I'll just keep drawing. I grew up in a small town in Custer County, Nebraska but I never thought to ask about my family's history until now. It all started with a photograph that someone once ripped right down the middle. I'm Katie Ferder. I'm back in my hometown, Broken Bow, researching my family history. There was a photo taken by Solomon Butcher that has a really interesting story behind it of the homesteading days of my family, and I'm here to see what I can find. But first, I'm going to go see my dad. My family has owned Fairder Auto Parts since 1952. That's my dad and three uncles. Uh, the others are my cousins. I have a journal that my dad kept. Mm, cool. And it was mostly, it, it just gave things they did. I mean, day-to-day -day stuff, went to the grocery store. To find store. out the whole story of my and family, I realized yeah, I needed uh, to go back farther than the 1960s. Let me get the Fairder files first. And here uh, we have the Bob Ferreter writings. And he must have loved to write because he just has all kinds of stories. My great grandfather, Robert J. Ferreter, was an avid Custer County historian. His nephew, Chuck, wrote a book about our family history that tells the story behind the photo that was taken at our family homestead. In the late 1800s, photographer Solomon Butcher took thousands of portraits like this of the settlers of Custer County. That's where the old dugout was. We've got a picture of it somewhere, but I, I can't tell you where it is. It turns out a family friend owns the land my ancestors homesteaded. But that was the original dugout for the Ferreter place. Awesome. Then they went from there to the Todd house down here on the corner. I'm standing on the land that my family homesteaded, and this is exactly where Solomon Butcher took the photo. Behind me is where the windmill featured in the photo stood. I've been told there's quite a story behind this photo, but first, I wanted to understand what homesteading was all about. The Homestead National Monument in Beatrice is digitizing homestead records to allow the public to access them. You can start just by typing in a last name here and we will see what comes up. I see that we have zero matches for the name that we searched for and there are cases where not all homestead uh, records did make it to the National Archives. 1.6 million people homesteaded, and it's estimated that 93 million Americans may be descended from homesteaders. Since we didn't find my great-great-grandfather, we decided to check the Bureau of Land Management website. There is Robert G. 
Verter. Great. There is a reason that he did not show up in our homestead record, and that's because he actually received his land under another authority, which was called the Timber Culture Act. Cool. I learned that the Timber Culture Act allowed homesteaders to claim 160 additional acres if they planted trees on one-fourth of their land. And Robert G. Fairder did just that. He was the 91st person to prove up on his claim. Now I was ready to find out more about my family's photo from historian John Carter of the Nebraska State Historical Society. Not the story, so let's go take a look at it. Okay, great. John learned of my family's unique story from my distant cousin, Chuck Fairder. Chuck kept the story within the family for many years, but John convinced him it was worth sharing. Butcher came out and made this photograph, and then for years it was lost, damaged, um, and that the family had it put back together again and that it's been a family heirloom ever since. As my distant cousin Chuck told the story, Solomon Butcher stayed with my family for a week. Just before he left, Butcher set up his camera and took the photo. Then he presented my great-great-grandfather with a bill. My great-great-grandfather demanded a discount for all the food he had supplied to Mr. Butcher and his horses. Butcher was furious. He tore up the photograph and left. Uh, when Butcher stomped off, he also said, I'm, I'm going to break the negative, relegate you to the dustbin of history. Um, now, what we learned years later was that he clearly did not break mm -hmm. the negative. OK, so this is the original negative that Solomon Butcher would have taken of the family. You hold it, hold it by the long edge, not by the corners. Why do you think he didn't break it? Bottom line is, Butcher was driven by his project. He was making photographs that he was going to use to tell the narrative of settlement on the Great Plains. Uh, clearly didn't break it. Uh, it. It exists to this day, and you've got it in your hands right now. Yeah. It's just really interesting. I mean, growing up in Broken Bow and not knowing any of it, and then now, you know, being here and having a chance to look at everything and find out way more than I ever had because I never asked. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories and go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment.